Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. It is my pleasure to introduce this panel with different perspectives. Birgit comes from the German Feet Association. Gustavo Jorge comes from Spain. Gustavo is our local representative. It is very interesting to hold these discussions. We have been working closely with the EU markets. I think there are more opportunities than ever. And we want to give you an outlook as to where we're going, where the international demand is coming from, what's happening in terms of sustainability, and there will be time for questions and answers at the end. I'm sorry, just one more thing. Birgit's presentation will be in English, so if you have your headsets, you can listen to the translation. Otherwise, you can go and get headsets. Yeah, muchas gracias. Buenos dias, hola. Um, I'm sorry, my Spanish, that's about it. So I will continue in English. Sorry for that. Um, I have been invited to talk about uh, sustainability and where are we going? I'm going to do this from the German perspective. Where do I come from? I come from a country that is included in the European Feed Manufacturers Federation. Um, as you see in my slide, Germany is quite a big um, feed manufacturers market. We have about 15% of the um, market share that is produced by German um, industry. Together with Spanish, the other big one, we are about 30% of the European compound feed market. Germany is important, of course, a lot of soy. Uh, I brought you one slide just to give you a hint uh, how the market does look like, how it changed. Um, you see it is slightly decreasing since the year 2014, the um, soy meal in the German compound feed decre decreased by about 20%. The German consumers' demands now and then are very different. In the past, as you see in my slide, the consumption of meat was very growing. Depending on the economic um, situation, people were asking for more and more meat. The highest level we in Germany consumed meat was in the 80s. Then we consumed about um, 100 kilograms per year. Um, in the beginning, people were asking for good prices. But since the middle 80s, beginning of the 90s, people have different demands. They are asking about sustainability. They are asking for non-GM. People uh, ask about deforestation and all these things. Um, and that is a situation we are facing as feed producers right now. The German market situation for feed producers, um, I put in one slide and I want to uh, point your attention on the highly competitive situation. We have hundreds of feed producer companies. When I talk about feed producers, I mean compound feed, because the German farmers, they don't buy the feed material, they buy a compound, a mixture of feed materials. That is what is sold to the German farmers. We have hundreds of these producers, so it's quite a highly competitive market situation. On the other hand, uh, compound feed is something you won't transport on long distances. So all the feed compound meals are located right to the farmer's place. Um, and the third point we are facing is the legal 
um, situation. We are, as feed producers, confronted with a lot of, um, with a number of regulations. The European Commission is giving to us feed safety and all these things. And the fourth um, point we are facing is the changing consumer demands and perception, as I just mentioned. If it comes to the question of sustainability, this is very important to bear in mind. Because if you ask me how to promote sustainability, then you have to be aware of four um, pillars. The first is uh, you have to bear in mind the common environmental and safety standards that we have to deal with in Germany and whole Europe, I would say. So this means, it doesn't matter what about sustainability, the first question will always be, is the feed safe? Because our customers are very aware of this. We had several crises with feed material that was uh, um, polluted with dioxin and all these things. We are very keen on pesticide residues. You might know Europe is kicking out a lot of pesticides already. So we are very keen if, you, if we import the feed material, because a lot of pesticides are not allowed in Europe anymore. One example was paraquat in the past. We had some trouble with that, because all over the world it is allowed, except Europe. Um, that's about feed safety standards. The second question is, uh, do we have a real um, reliable political environment? What about the NGOs in our country? They are very keen. They put a lot of pressure on the GMO market. They want us to produce feed without GMO. Um, our government is supporting this idea. Our government invented a non-GM seal already with regulation how to produce non-GM food and non-GM feed. The third question is, um, are the consumers are really willing to pay for what we call sustainability? Uh, there's a big difference we figured out between what the people tell you they want and the price they are willing to pay for that. So there's a big difference between talking and acting. Um, the last uh, question is about certification. Um, it's not easy to uh, discuss this with sustainability because therefore you should define what is sustainability for, for you. And one example where it fits together was in fact, sorry for that, was the non-GMO market. It's, it became a booming market in Germany, that's for sure. Um, I, in my slide I put the numbers and you might be surprised surprised but that's that's a fact within the f last during the last few years this market grew very fast so 60% of the feed we are selling to dairy farmers is already non gm for poultry and egg production it's even more we have 80% so if you go in a german supermarket you won't find any egg without the non-GM logo on it. You can't buy them, you can't find them. It's all driven by the retailers, by the German supermarkets. They give the rules because they are very powerful. We have about six retailers in Germany representing 80% of the German market. So whatever they ask us, whatever they ask the farmers or the dairies or the slaughterhouses, we have to make sure to deliver this. And the non-GM question was driven by the retailers, and that's why this market grows so fast. The funny thing is, um, 
it's, I think it's typical German. They define non-GM as sustainable, even if there's no, no argument for this, but they define it. It is hard for us to argue against it. We're trying. We say, for us, non-GM has nothing to do with sustainability. But it is hard because the NGOs in Germany are very powerful and they define, they say, you can work sustainable only if you produce non-GM. Um, I talked to, to Jorge, it's, it's typical German, uh, this, this topic, but it's growing. I have to say, because Germany supermarkets buy from all over, Ger all over Europe. So there are a lot of companies in, in, in the Netherlands, in Poland, in Denmark. They are all selling their dairy products, their meat, to the German market. So it is a growing market for that. So this should be for the beginning. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Birgit. It's your turn. I apologize because I do not have a presentation. I'd like to thank Appreciate for my invitation. I'd like to thank them for the project we're working together on. I'm here on behalf of the Spanish feed industry. The industry is very much related to agriculture production. This involves farmers, cattle breeders. As Birgit has said, together with Germany, we're one of the largest feed producers. And we are growing year by year. But our expectations is that this growth will continue. And unlike our German colleagues who have access to other plant vegetable prote plant proteins, we have a protein deficit, so we're more independent. We produce different types of products. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Birgit? Can you hear me? No me escucha. Can you hear me? And for us, it's the same whether it's GMO or not. Testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Testing, testing. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Sustainability is another example of projects we have been working on as a sector for years. Appreciate has been our partner. And at the time of the truth, consumers tell us, no, sustainability is a philosophy and should be the minimum, not something you will get a uh, reward or compensation. This should be mainstream production. We're now seeing and facing another problem, and this is what I wanted to discuss here. And I've been lucky because this trip has helped us to test this idea and set the context. I don't know how Mercosur will evolve in the future, Mercosur as an organization, but in Europe, we our situation is the following. There are large areas, even sovereign areas, such as food production. For years, gradually, ultimate decisions have been going from national states to a European level. Now there is European competition, there is an integration process, there's no news there, and there, 
many integration steps. We have been doing this for decades. This will continue. It's good in general terms. But member states are still reluctant to give up sovereign competency. But there is something where we, well, most of us agree on, and that's food production. The rules and regulations of food production in Europe or in our part of Europe, the European Union, as member states who have lost our capacity to make big decisions. This has been a long process which has accelerated over the last few years. And this is decided by the European Parliament, which is a crazy house with over 700 members. It's very difficult for them to agree on something, but they really do their job. There is a commission, the European Commission. The chairwoman has been elected. She will have to pass a test, and a program will have to be presented, and it should be attractive enough for the parliament to approve it. The parliament is quite hard. One or two ministers will have to be changed, but eventually an agreement is reached, or will be reached. At present, this new parliament, which has just been elected, is quite diverse. The big traditional parties have a lower relative weight, and many other parties are also represented with different food production philosophies, which are less conventional, and the new chairwoman will have a hard time to approve things. We know that within her package, within the agenda she will submit, there is a strong environmental agenda. We have already heard about some things. It's not yet public, but we know what the big lines are. As to the environment, that's going to be one of the stars, which is logical in a parliament such as this one. The big part would be plastic, microplastic in the sea. Those will be the big goals. But then there will also be a big focus on agri-food production, because it's a trendy fashion, because consumers voice out their opinions, and thirdly, because it's one of those areas where community organizations have full jurisdiction. We don't know yet how she's going to sell this. Maybe it's something quite European. It might be called a neutral European strategy or something like that. Or some deadlines will be set, 2030. This is very much European. We first depend define the landmarks, and then we see how we reach those landmarks. From now until 2022, we'll reach 10%, and then by 2030, it's going to be 50%. It's more of a marketing speech, but we know it will come, and we know it's different from sustainability models or other production models where the market, well, well it's market things, market issues. It depends on market willingness. We had some agreements with APRECID and other similar organizations in other countries. You develop things freely in the market. In this case, it would be a regulatory package. And the national states are closer partners will have to execute the program, the programs, but the big rules will be set at the European Parliament level. We know that this strategy, which, whose name we don't know yet, will imply strong regulations and demands. But the whole package well, will include a carbon footprint aspect because of the European Union dynamics, which Gustavo is very familiar with because he spent a long time in Brussels. There will probably be a plan A, then plan B. B will be more ambitious than A. We don't know, for example, what they will demand from us. Probably carbon footprint reduction, but what does that mean? Would, would this affect the whole chain? Transportation, of course, plays a big role there. We're going to measure water footprint. What happens with the whole transportation system, with the ocean? 
We don't know how demanding it's going to be, but we do know that starting in autumn, things are going to become hard, and we will be some. We will have some years to develop a strategy as a segment, as a value chain, as industrial transformers. We use raw materials and transform them into feed. Sometimes raw materials come from far away. Argentina is a strategic supplier, so this trip has helped me to talk this to different parts of our chain. We're thinking of seeing the following well, You demand this, but before you set this demand, what is the methodology going to be like? How are you going to reach that current footprint? We suggest this. As a sector, we suggest that we get organized and do this. And initially, we said, well, and since what we do not have now is a methodology to measure common emissions, we have some work, but we do not have a common framework. So what we have suggested to our partners in the value chain, I proceed as CR and others informally for now, is why don't we develop here at the origin a methodology, a common methodology to estimate those good environmental practices requirements that go beyond sustainability and beyond the mandatory aspects. Maybe we can develop something with our local partners and we can go back to our political representatives and say, well, we have worked this out with our suppliers at the origin, tested by independent organizations such as INTA. Jorge Inveltor is here with us. We had a small, inf a short informal meeting about this. Maybe we the sector, the value chain, can be the ones that supply the methodology. By the end of the day, it's a country strategy. We want our partners, Argentina being our major partner, wa be able to sell us. We, throughout the chain, can measure how the methodology a common methodology to measure things. And the key is to do things before others request us to do them. So we have to find a common way of working. We have to be as ambitious as a regulatory framework. We're willing to do that. As industrial transformers, and we're also willing to fund that. That's an agreement we have already, already reached internally. But the key is that we want to do things ourselves. We want this to be real, efficient. We want to meet the interests of both parties, of both regions. We have had good and bad experiences in the past, but usually when we've been proactive and when, as a value chain, we have provided solutions, they've usually been accepted by politicians and by the administrations. So I'm here, and I'm happy to be here and with you, but I've also come to start testing these possibilities. And for now, well, I guess the next question is whether you think this is possible because you are transportation, but I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to share these ideas with you. Thank you, Jorge Gustavo. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're facing a challenge in terms of sustainability. So far, demands have been selective. They've come from private standards. If you wanted, you could apply those standards and enjoy the benefits. But what we're seeing now is something different. We're seeing that sustainability is a requirement and a condition for marketing. What Jorge is saying and what our colleague from Germany has also told us is showing that this is becoming a generalized market demand. And why is this important for Argentina and for APRECID? Why should we discuss these issues? And we were discussing this 
with Tomas a few days ago. Argentina is clearly an agri-exporter country. And if you consider grains, oil seeds, 40% of everything we sell to the world comes from you, comes from our industry, primary production sector, exporters, input suppliers, all of us who are attending this Congress. And the main export product is soy meal. That's a key ingredient for the feed industry, the European feed industry, to be able to keep growing. Argentina is the main European supplier and exporter, and Europe has traditionally been our major market. Over the last few years, thanks to economic growth in Southeast Asia, many other countries have also started to buy part of what, what we would sell to Europe. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and other countries are buying a lot of soybean meal. So it is, we shouldn't think of Europe only because there are multiple markets for our products. There are in the case of corn, over 100 export markets, oil, 20 markets, soybean, one big market, China, and wheat, over 28 markets, but especially Brazil. Why then is Europe important? If you look at these figures, you can say, well, if Europe is demanding this, then I can sell to the rest of the world. That's a big mistake because Europe is still a big buyer. And besides, Europe sets international regulatory trends. Every time Brussels and they meet with the Brussels representatives uh, or the European Parliament representatives, they set some guidelines that are very attractive to Asian countries because in general terms we consider that Europe leads that development and evolution in terms of food safety, environmental safety. So the impact of what is discussed in Brussels is global. And Europe has been telling us for long, since 2012, that they want to do something with this. In 2012, the White Book on Climate Issues was published. And this started talking about something that looked weird at the time. Why, why not have an environmental footprint? As a way of joining all different methodologies, all retailing standards, in a set of 14 indicators for all food, beverages, and products sold in Europe. They invited several countries to join them and work together, several products in some countries. Chile, for example, participated quite actively in the grapes and wine export sector. Using this methodology suggested by Jorge, Brazil did the same thing with concentrated orange juice. Colombia worked on coffee, and they discussed this methodology of quantification and carbon sequestration. Because now there's a new concept here, which might be very interesting for us. That is the decarbonization of the economy, of the goods and services we consume. That neutral carbon concept is becoming increasingly stronger. And we have resources to try to position ourselves within that new international context. But in order to do this, we have to choose the best methodology. And not all available methodologies consider that concept of carbon balance. So what do we have so far in the international market so far? In Argentina, we have seen some developments. The first one is the biodiesel market. As a sector, we buy 4 million tons of soybean a year under sustainability conditions in primary production. In the past, we would have the EPA soybean. You may have participated in that project with documents, freight certificates, agreement, etc., to show that there's been no change in soil use. And now, since we have recovered the bi European biodiesel market, we need that soybean to be sustainable using the mass balance concept 
and consequently we have to go back to the chain to generate this type of documents and certifications, risk analysis in production plus, there are two standards, ISCC and 2BS, no deforestation since January 2018. This is what is the minimum we have in Argentina, which is already working. In terms of soybeans, we do not have too much because the largest buyer is China that is not demanding sustainability. However, in March this year, China launched the national carbon footprint policy. In our last trip, China and solidarity that is working in China started to say, why don't we start suggesting sustainability standards for soybean imports, considering what Europe is doing? So the largest buyer in the world is already thinking of transferring these requirements and applying them as well. In Argentina, there are several developments. We worked with INTA to carry out some studies on the life cycle of the soybean value chain, we found major differences in final results when we compared our results to the European studies. The European studies deteriorate the conditions of calculations considering Mercosur agriculture. So it's important to generate our own science, our RTS, certified agriculture. Recently, some leading companies in the agri industry, such as Bangui, completed a study with TNC to map the great Argentinian Chaco. Today, at the department level, we have all the necessary information layers for the last few years to differentiate deforestation and human development conditions as well. We might be able to coordinate a non-deforestation system in terms of the Argentinian Chaco area. This information is already available, but we do not have a comprehensive system. If on January 1st next year somebody requested that we certify soybean meal for the European market, we won't be able to do it because the costs for the value chain would be very high and there would be no reward. There would only be additional costs to comply with those regulations. This is why it's interesting to think and look into the future. And we should take advantage of the fact that the recent European Union Mercosur agreement with the whole chapter on sustainable development is a challenge that will help us progress internally. The challenges are no longer long-term challenges. We will have to face those challenges in only a few years. This year, this week, Jorge suggested that we all work together, the European feed industry with the Argentinian exporting industry, with the manufacturers association. We have to start working together to generate our own methodologies and calculations. So these are new export conditions. This will no longer be a niche. This will be a mandatory production and marketing requirement. Even though the EU is the first market in the world to develop these standards, the other buying countries will eventually copy this trend. We are now discussing with the Chinese government the authorization to sell soybean meal to China for the first time ever. And we're having meetings with different technical people. Last week, they told us we had to be direct and free certified. According to what standard? The European standard. That's what the Chinese government said. And this is what I would like you to understand. The world is copying European regulations. And this is why it's important to have an influence on Brussels to be able to sell to the Asian governments. Here in Argentina, there are many people who are going along the same line, but individually. We have to get together. We have to integrate a value chain so as to generate a single process. Many of us are promoting this in the Rosario Stock Exchange. They're starting to talk about a national neutral carbon program where everybody can cooperate. That's the only way because otherwise the costs will be too high and a business opportunity will become a business barrier if we don't do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gustavo. There is some time for questions. I've already received some. We have a few minutes for questions. 
I'm trying to summarize some of the questions. The first question is for Birgit. Are these non-GMO, sustainability, etc., these demands, do they come from a demand from German or European consumers, or do these demands come from a social class that can afford that price difference? We've always said that it's going to be the way to get into Europe, but in the case of Germany, non-GMO, we'd like to know where that's what's happening. It's a good one. Um, everybody is talking about the consumer, and we are always wondering who this is. Um, if you ask German consumers, do you want to eat a milk or drink a milk that is produced with feed that is genetically modified, they always say, no, we don't. If you ask them, what does it mean, nobody knows the answer. And the, but the thing is, um, there was a lot of pressure from non-governmental organizations. They, they figured out the retailers, the supermarkets, if you get access to them, then you will rule the market. So the supermarkets, are, if you ask them, they always say, oh, all our consumers is asking, are asking for non-GM. But in fact, consumers in Germany do not have the chance to buy GM, because you won't find it in the supermarket. So um, it is driven by NGOs. They figured out just be keen on the supermarkets and then this market will grow. Okay, thanks. Thank you. There are also some comments focused on what Gustavo and Jorge said. You have mentioned some examples about business models where the chain may be shorter or fewer complexes, so to speak, and we know that soya bean goes through many transformations, it's a complex system, and the challenge is precisely to reach an agreement throughout the chain, and this is what Jorge said. How do you see this challenge looking forward? Do you think it might become an obstacle? How should we face this challenge? How can we all reach an agreement, participate in these discussions and show that it can be done. And do you think this is more difficult than what happens with a shorter chain? Well, the easy answer is to say, I see this in terms of opportunity. Gustavo has said this. This will become a reality. You can consider this a regulatory cost, or you can say, well, this, the Argentinian production chain, or the, cha the Spanish production chain, whatever. You can say, I'm going to sell this as an opportunity. My chain is the best, and my chain is the one that has clearly and transparently developed all this methodology. And what we d defend is the optimal environmental strategy. Well, this is not nuclear physics. We see that we've been working on this for a long time. We've worked with other sectors, with partners. And as Gustavo said, the issue is that there are too many projects ongoing. I see this is an opportunity for something that is complex from a technical point of view, but we can do things better this time. Maybe in some time, we will need additional developments with other strategic Serbian suppliers, such as Brazil. But I'd rather start with Argentina at the European level, at the feed production level, we're now only thinking of soya bit, but once we develop this methodology, we should start working on corn, because we want to recover corn from Argentina. We will do this in our next season, and I hope this will help us to achieve the same results with other raw materials. Gustavo. Considering the point of view of exporters, what is their commitment? Because I've seen some statements by some big companies that they are willing to take over these commitments. What do you think will be the level of involvement? And 
what is the vision regarding these environmental issues and market demands? Well, most companies are taking over global commitments in terms of sustainability. The recent experience with the successful agreement with TNC in Argentina on the mapping of different production sites and forestation areas in Chaco in Argentina, that's a big example. On the other hand, quite recently some companies have also announced loans to work on sustainability. A leading, a leading Argentinian company has just made this global announcement. In general terms, we're very much interested in starting to walk along this way. We have recreated our sustainability commission in our association. Next week, we'll go back to these issues because there is general interest. But this general interest is to find the best positioning for Argentina and not the best advantage for a single company. Because in terms of sustainability, well, it's just like with food safety. If we have salmonella or pollutants or rejections of products somewhere in the world, it is a country who loses beyond the specific cost for a shipment. Argentina's reputation will be affected and we represent our country when we export products. And this is we have to find a way of working that involves strong commitment by the chain to go towards the same goal with the same methodology and get together with buyers to validate that methodology. If we validate that methodology with Europe, then it will be much easier to take it to Southeast Asia or to other countries to be acknowledged as a valid methodology. If we do this on our own, behind closed doors, we might have several difficulties eventually for someone to buy that methodology. And it might be possible that others will impose their own methodology. So I think the challenge is to work together with a demand to have a single sustainability vision. Well, I think we've come to the end of this panel with different perspectives. Just one final thought. What the speakers have shown and what we have discussed is that we have to work together as a sector. Here in APRESI, there are several producers, but we need to understand that this goes beyond the APRESI community. And as Gustavo, Jorge, and Birgit said, we have to find the right positioning for our country in the light of some markets which have specific demands. Thank you very much for your for sharing your point of view with us and I hope we will all work towards a fruitful result. Thank you.